to the Christian Village Church in Forked River. And good to have you aboard again. And we're studying in the book of Revelation. And uh, join us, if you would, for a few moments, because uh, we've been spending some time here, so I really can't keep the folks that long tonight. But we're in uh, Revelation 21 uh, and uh, verse 9. Revelation chapter 21, verse 9. And basically, it continues the theme that we were covering in the service you just finished, the Sunday morning service, and look what it says. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues. Now that's something, you know, I, I just can't go back and spend the time, but we covered the seven angels and the seven vials and the seven plagues one at a time. Let me just say it has to do with the seven chakras. And for those of you who have not ordered your revelation chart showing the seven chakras and lined up with the seven signs of the uh, seven planets that they knew at that time, please just let me know and we'll send one to you. But that has to do with the seven chakras, which are the seven nerve centers, which begin at the sacrum, the base of the spine, and work their way up to the pineal or pineal gland of the brain. And that's what this refers to. So this is one of the angels, and we've seen that angel earlier in, in some of the other tapes, and he talks with me saying, Come here, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Okay? Now here is where we, as we start to finish the book of Revelation, we really prepare for brain surgery. I mean, this is specifically talking about your mind. The whole book of Revelation is geared around the human body, and we're culminating here with a discussion of the mind and as we've showed you uh, in the service that you just finished watching the Sunday morning service, when we talk about the lamb, you are indeed right when you consider that we are talking about Aries. That's it. Lamb, ram of God, which takes away the sin of the world, which means the sun entering into that constellation is the point where the days now are long, the sun is out, uh, the trees have leaves, all new life is born again. That's the marriage of the lamb, the burnt offering that we were talking about a little earlier on this tape. The bride, the lamb's wife, is you. Okay? The bride, the lamb's wife, is you and me. So here it says, come and I will show you the bride. Watch that. The bride, the lamb's wife. And so in other words, there must be an intercourse here between you and the lamb, all right? And what happens and how that occurs is that that which is the chrism, which we talked about earlier, that oil, which is Christ in Greek, that part of you must rise up to that spinal area to the pineal gland of the brain and touch that, and there will be the intercourse between you and the lamb. And that's, where, that's the exact same as when the sun moves through its trajectory, through the Earth's trajectory, up to Aries and intercourses with Aries in the universe. Same thing. Only this is talking about what goes on inside of your body as opposed to how it actually goes on outside in the sky. It's the macrocosm outside, the microcosm inside. And as Albert was talking about, and I think you can attest to this, Albert, that basically uh, the human body is a miniature universe. And it is subject to the same laws as the outside universe. And therefore, uh, the atoms and the universes and all of the planets and all of these small things which are within us will move in the same law as that which is on the outside. So the sun intercoursing with the constellation Aries is the same as the chrism within you intercoursing with the pineal or pineal gland of the brain. That is the lamb's wife. So the sun rising into the lamb. And of course, when, a, when man intercourses with woman, there is birth. There is new life created. In the same way, when the chrism, when that which is the son of man intercourses with the pineal gland, what it's saying here, there is new life. There is a new you. There are new aspects of your personality. Same way, when the sun intercourses with the constellation Aries, there is new life. There is springtime. There is summer. The trees have leaves, etc., etc., etc. The inside of you, then, is what we're talking about. The inside of your head, where the pineal or pineal gland is contained, that's the lamb. So we can put up here pineal, pineal gland of the brain and understand that and relate that to Aries, which is 
the constellation of the ram or the lamb. What happens then, and this is what the ancients taught, and you're not going to get a doctor to be able to show you this because we're talking metaphysics. We're talking spiritual things. We're talking things that happen uh, universally from vibrations, from the, from the cosmos and from your own energies, kind of lean What happens according to the ancient teachings is when the lamb which is the pineal gland, receives the vibration of the serpentine fire, which is the kundalini, through the pituitary gland, there's a tremendous light. And that is what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 22. If your eye be single, your body fills with light. The ancients believe that the pituitary gland and the pineal gland were as two poles of a battery. And that kundalini effect would cause an arcing from the pituitary to the pineal, which would open a tremendous light and cast that light smack into the right hemisphere of your brain. The doors, in other words, this would be the electricity to open the electric doors, and they would swing wide, exposing the temple on the right side. And then, bang, it's open to you. New light, new, new, new creation, new understanding. And you know, it's sometimes when we think of these things as being far-fetched, but yet we've sat and we've listened to organized religion for all of these years, and we've listened to the most far-fetched, yeah, I was going to say a word, but we've listened to some of the most far-fetched stuff that you could ever consider. I mean, you know, God is coming with atomic bombs, and he's going to blow up Israel so his son can go back in a hail of bullets riding a white horse over a Kennedy Airport dodging 747. I mean, that's a little bit far-fetched. And I think when you start talking about the activity of the brain and the mind and the glands of the brain, etc., the, the aspects of the brain. I said, why, why not? I mean, you know, this is really something that we're seeing taking place now. And, and the point is, if indeed the human body works in concert with the universe, then you can prove these things as, as they, they happen in the universe. So the chrism, which is the fluid, the oil, passing through the pituitary and the pineal is the oil for the lamp. Let's take a look at something on page 26 in your little Bibles. And for the rest of you, go to Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25, okay? And we'll start off. What we're looking at here is this is the, sec this is the coming of the bridegroom to take his bride. Well, right now, as you're living and breathing on the universe, the bridegroom who is coming to take his bride in, 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 in zodiacal mythology is the, is the planet Uranus. Uranus was married to the earth, Gaia. And they had children, and one of the children was Saturn. And Saturn forced Uranus out of heaven. And then Saturn was in turn forced out of heaven, but Uranus was separated from his bride. Oh, yeah. In other words, God and man were separated. Well, right now as you sit here, I'm not talking about anything spiritual. I'm not talking about anything metaphysical. I'm talking about an actual scientific astronomical fact. Uranus is moving back to claim its bride, the earth. The son of heaven is returning. And that's what Uranus is called, the son of heaven. So the bridegroom is returning for his bride. This is the second coming of Christ. This, you know, it's amazing. You see a lot of empty seats. This, we're talking about the second coming of Christ. What did Jesus say? The bridegroom is coming back for the bride. What is Uranus? Uranus is the bridegroom. Gaia of the earth is the bride. And Uranus is coming back for the bride. Uranus is coming back to intercourse and enter into Aquarius. And that's the Aquarian age. The bridegroom coming for his bride is the second coming of Christ. And where is everybody? <laughs> the same place they were when he came the first time. Home! <laughs> There's Jesus Christ walking around town. Everybody comes to church. They pack church. They go to church Christmas Eve. You can't even get in the place. But when the guy was here, nobody even showed up. I love the Bhagwan. He said, gee, the Jews really screwed it up. They waited for the Messiah for 4,000 years. When they came, he killed them. And they get, they, when they came, they killed them. And they gave the business over to the Italians. <laughs> I mean, it's true. What do you think? The guy had to hang out in the mountains. He slept on wood and everything. And he, here he is. Now, since he's died, they, they kill him and everything. And now they come in church and they make Christmas cards. It's great, isn't it? Isn't it wild? And here, you people come, and you have the entire understanding that the second coming of Christ is... You can even say when it's happening. I say, no man knows the hour. You do, because no mind knows the hour. When it says no man knows the hour, it means the hour is not known to you through the mind. It is known to you through the nirvana, through the higher consciousness, through God consciousness. And so you do know. 2010. And you who are into numerology here know that the number three means new life, resurrection, all things are new, all things are wonderful, and 2010 is 
2 plus 1 equals 3. Why not? I don't know if I believe that. doesn't make any difference whether you believe it or not. I wonder if it happens and you didn't believe it. You see? But I get on a, as I said, you get on a plane flying to San Francisco and you think you're going to Florida. Well, when the plane lands, you're going to be in San Francisco anyhow. It doesn't make any difference what you believe. Here we are. I had a few drinks. What I want to say, this fellow sitting next to me in this beautiful 747. Here I am on my way to New York, and here you are on your way to San Francisco, and we meet right here in the middle. <laughs> Somebody's on the wrong plane. But it doesn't make any difference. Who cares? See? You know, that, that was an... <laughs> That was a joke from an old record I had many years ago. How many of you heard of Woody Woodbury? Do you ever remember Woody Woodbury? Woody Wood... Woody... Do you remember Woody Woodbury? Woody Woodbury was a comedian down in um, Florida. And he made this record, which is a classic. And I loaned it to somebody. And like you always do, you know, it never came back. But this guy was really good. I, I, I'll have to remember some of his jokes. But that was one of them, you know. That was one of them. So it doesn't make any difference necessarily what you believe. It's a question of... The bridegroom is returning. We talked about this thing about uh, maybe a day before meditation and abstinence from sexual intercourse so that you, you know, retain the oil that can be used to rise up to that land. I want to show you something here. Matthew 25, let's go to verse 4. This is the second coming. <clears throat> uh, let's look at uh, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. You see that? Okay. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. When you come in here to meditate, you sit on the floor, you kick your shoes off, whatever you do, you are actually coming here to see the bridegroom. You are coming here to raise yourself up to the lamp. You are coming here to await the bridegroom. And that's the admonition here to have oil in the lamp because that's part of the physical makeup of what will happen during the meditation process. See, and then you have supporting that Jesus saying to Mary Magdalene, do not touch me, woman, for I have not yet ascended up to the Father. See? And here it says, when, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. You know? And so they're not prepared. And at midnight, there was a cry, behold, the bridegroom comes. Why at midnight? Because it's 12 o'clock. It's perfection. And it's back to the 12 signs of the zodiac, and so forth and so on. But here, when the, um, when, the, when, when, when the bridegroom came, some people saw him. Some people felt it. Those who had some oil in their lamps reached this rapture experience, this kundalini experience. Those who didn't, who had spilled out their energies and their fire on the outside instead of allowing some to build up and go up, to, missed it. So you see how important that is, you see. And, and as I, once again, I say I'm not, I'm not advocating celibacy. I don't believe in that. I don't think that's, that's normal in any way, shape, or form. But there is a discipline that has to be exercised by all of us to, at least when we are going to direct ourselves up to that, to that bridegroom, we should be prepared. And we should come into meditation with, <laughs> excuse the expression, some oil in the lamp. I mean, that's how else can you put it? It should. And that's the chrism, that's the Christ. You see, that comes down from the claustrum of the brain. And we told you that's Santa Claus, it really is. It comes down from the claustrum of the brain, goes into the pituitary gland, goes into the pineal gland, down into the solar plexus where life is conceived, the oil. And through meditation, that oil and that chrism is in Greek, that word means Christ. Here is Christ then coming down, do you see this? Christ coming down from heaven, down to save you, to create life, to give you life. And then by the crucifixion, which is of the five senses through meditation, what happens? The Son of Man raises and resurrects back up into the Father's house. And there is new life. So it's, it's all words and symbols and allegory to simply define for you what goes on in your body. What goes on in your body. Now let's take a look at Revelation 21, verse 10. It's on page... Uh, 229 in your little Bible. Revelation 21, verse uh, 10. And he carried me away 
in the spirit to a great and high mountain. Okay. I, I mean, you know, even if you're not into this too, too much, it, it's, it's pretty obvious what's going on here. You're being a carried away in the spirit. Say, what's the spirit? How can you be carried away in the spirit? See, that, that's, the, that's the point of all this. And, you know, no, I, I study, and I want all of you to read and study and, and do all you can, but don't think that that's going to get you anywhere, because it's not. You can listen to me till the cows come home. It's not going to get you to first base. It's interesting, and I appreciate that. And we have revelation of God ways, and I appreciate that. But it's all bets off. When you hit the floor and raise your consciousness, forget about it. Just absolutely forget about it. Nothing you learned anywhere will amount to two cents once you go up there. Because if you are ready, and if you are directing yourself there instead of something that somebody told you, you will be taken off in the spirit to a very high mountain, to a high range, uh, uh, ecstatic range of consciousness. And that's to be admitted into the realm of the higher mind, and that's what that is. And in the realm of the higher mind, you enter the great city, which is the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And that's, look at what it says, verse 10. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And, th and that's what comes down to you. Look at Take a look at page 177 in your little Bibles. For the rest of you, go to Galatians chapter 4 and uh, go to verse 24. Here is uh, Galatians 4 verse 24. The Apostle Paul saying, which things are an allegory? He's saying this is allegorical. And if you go into verse 5, Agar is Mount Sinai and answers to Jerusalem, which now is in his bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. That's the spirit. So here it's then saying that as you are carried off into this high mountain to this heavenly Jerusalem, in other words, this, this nirvana, this bliss of divine consciousness in the high realms of your nature starts to be coming downward to intercourse that with your, your carnal mind. In other words, it's coming down where you, it's reachable, it's touchable, it's, it's within reach. You know, you, you, you lift your consciousness and this heavenly Jerusalem, this heavenly feeling comes down out of the higher mind to touch you. So here comes the holy place, you see, within you. Here is what, in fact, Jerusalem comes from the root of two words. It's Jeru, which is vision of God, and Salem, which means peace. Okay? Peace. And that's Jerusalem, perfect peace. The vision of God, perfect peace. And that comes through the penny. Now, how do you get a vision of God? See, how can you get a vision of God? Because you can't see God. <clears throat> yeah, well, I know I'm bleeding there. <laughs> you want to see God face to face. In, in the Bible, in mysticism, the word face does not mean face like I have or you have. The word face means understanding. Okay, intellect, understanding, knowledge, wisdom, that's what face means. So you want to see God face to face. In other words, you want to come right into the presence of this, whatever it is, this thing, and receive this wisdom, receive this knowledge, receive this understanding. So you say, well, how am I going to do that? Go to Genesis chapter 32. Okay, Genesis chapter 32, the first book in the Bible. And there, turn to page... 30. And look at that. And everybody should see it. Everybody should see that with your own eyes. Don't just, if you have a Bible or somebody sitting next to you doesn't have one, just stick it over there. And I want you to see it. Genesis chapter 32, verse 30. Jacob saw God face to face. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Here you go. The Peniel gland is known by the ancients to be Aries the ram. And when you intercourse, when you intersect, when you touch that pineal gland, you see God face to face. When that is activated, when that burnt offering, when that fire is directed upward and consumes the pineal gland, it's the same as the sun rising up to consume Aries. Summer comes to your life. The spring comes into your life. All things become new. But there you see, he said, I have seen God face to face. And look at the next verse. And as he passed over pineal, the sun, this is spelled a little different, the sun rose upon him. He halted upon his thigh. Do you see he halted upon his thigh? See that where it says he halted upon his thigh? Because when he was wrestling with God in, in this mythological adventure he had, 
His thigh had to be put out. God put his thigh out in order to win the contest against Jacob. But the thigh means desire because it's in the area of, of the sexual area. And so it's a symbol of desire. In other words, the desire for himself, his physical, his, his own way had to be put out before he could see God face to face. It's the same as taking no thought. You've got to eliminate that desire for the lower things so that you can see higher things. And there is where Jacob, after that happened, Jacob's name was changed from Jacob to Israel because Isis now was his, Ra was his, El was his, spirit and mind had been totally communion, uh, communioned together within himself, the living God. Okay? Incidentally, when we start on Sunday nights and we finish the book of Revelation, we're going to be doing something different every Sunday night. And one of the things I'm going to be doing on one of the Sunday nights, so we don't get ourselves sandbagged nothing, we're going to be doing <coughs> information about ancient religions, the Dark Ages, we're going to be doing uh, uh, Hare Krishna and Jesus Christ, we're going to be doing Zoroaster, we're going to be doing the Old Testament, uh, the Garden of Eden, a lot of interesting things, and we're going to be doing something different every Sunday, <coughs> you know, and uh, so we, you know, we don't want to get, well, the message that came through to me spiritually is that not to get caught in just one thing because there are too many things that we're going to be sharing, exciting things, and we've got to be open to them. So <clears throat> as we finish up here, we understand then that this Jerusalem comes as a result of this pineal or pineal gland. It has nothing to do with Jerusalem, which is in the Middle East, but has everything to do with that higher mind. See, this <clears throat> which descends uh, from the higher mind, it, it says, it goes on, it says, has the glory of God which is that, that ray, that, 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 that single eye, that light then which peeks down and touches you. One of the things, <clears throat> as you get to understand, this all starts, this all starts back in the early part of the Bible in Numbers chapter 2, verse 2. And this is the way it started. God, in the desert camp, set the 12 tribes of Israel around the tabernacle, which is the center. That's the holy place of the brain. That's the right hemisphere. That's the center place. That's where God dwells within. And then it is set up in, at four compass points, the north, the south, the east, and the west. And over here on the east was positioned the tribe of Judah, where it says in the Bible, the sun rises. See? And that's why God's chosen people are Jews. Not Jews, as you know, Jews, those who dwell in the right side, the east side, where the sun rises, Jew of the tribe of Judah. He chose that to represent the place of the right hemisphere of the brain where that sun rises. Now, he puts the tribe of Reuben in the south, and the reason is because that represents the physical, and Reuben had intercourse with his concubines, with his own relatives. There was a physical problem. He put the tribe of Dan in the north, and Dan represents the emotionals because it says Dan nips at the rider's heel like an adder, the emotional warring. And he puts the tribe of Ephraim in the, in the west to represent the intellect. Now, interestingly enough here, what happens? Exactly what you're seeing now. Here is the light of Christ. Here is the, the understanding of spirit. Here is the knowledge that comes from the right hemisphere, which is divine knowledge which comes from God. But what is it that blocks out that sun? What is it that blocks out that light? What is it that blocks out that spirit? That which comes from the West, the intellect. You get so doggone intelligent about this stuff and you study it and you've got so many philosophies as to how this works that you've overridden the spirit and you really don't know anything at all. When you start to try to figure this out too deeply, you've gotten so much west involved that it encroaches, and it's just like here, 4.30, there's no sun. It's all shut down. The west is in control. The intellect is in control. And when your intellect is in control, you've got darkness. And so you see, the whole thing is based on astronomy, astro astrological science. The whole thing is based on it. You cannot in any way, shape, or form read the Bible unless you have some basic knowledge of uh, astronomy and the zodiac. You can't do it. And as you can see, so it's all based here. There are three tribes here, three here, three here, three here. And this carries through the entire Bible. The holy city in the book of Revelation has three gates on the east, three in the west, three in the north, three in the south. And so this is where it started, back 
in, in, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the desert sands. And it's, it's, it's traditionally recognized that when these tribes marched, the tribe of Judah was led, and the commander of the tribe of Judah led that tribe, seated upon a white horse. And he carried that, which is the banner of um, Leo. It's the signal, the sign of Leo, which is, and that's why they call the Lion of Judah, because their banner was Leo. And all the other tribes had a banner which reflected one of the signs of the zodiac. So how are you going to eliminate all of this stuff? If you do, you're, you're going to be doing what we've done for 2,000 years since the Lord Jesus Christ left, and that is destroy everything that has been put into the spiritual realm by the Buddha, by Krishna, by all the rest of them, by Jesus Christ. And, and we just literalize it, and we assemble people in a church and tell them some stories and tell them uh, if they shape up when they die, nice things are going to happen. You know, what a deal. But on the other hand, when we begin to understand this, and understand how the universe works, the zodiac works, and how the Bible is in harmony with it, we realize that our mandate is to get in harmony with the universe, get in harmony with nature. I remember one of the things that, uh, that tape we have with Kataro that he said in his, um, when he made his tour to the United States, and he said, people have to be kind to nature. As a Buddhist, I was very concerned about being kind to nature. And that means we bring ourselves into a harmony. When our bodies are allowed and we understand our bodies working in the same way that the universe works, we get into a harmony with it and we can flow with it and we understand it. And that's where our salvation will come from. So thank you for sharing this time uh, here.